a scholar's scholar and a warrior's warrior. Today on Uncommon Knowledge, General James Mattis, USMC. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. A native of Washington State, James Mattis enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 1969, the year after he graduated from high school, and served in ROTC while he attended Central Washington State University. By the time General Mattis retired from the Marine Corps as a full general in 2013, he had commanded men in combat in Iraq during the Persian Gulf War, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq once again during the Iraq War. He had also served as the NATO Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation, as Commander of the United States Joint Forces Command, and as Commander of the United States Central Command, also known as CENTCOM, where General Mattis was responsible for the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. General Mattis is now a fellow at the Hoover Institution, the think tank at Stanford. Jim Mattis, welcome. Thank you. I should state that you insist that I call you Jim and not General. Thank I'll shine you. your shoes anytime you want and call you general, but you insist on Jim. Is it true that you always kept with you a copy of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius? Uh, it is, Peter. That one and uh, quite a few other books, actually. So a Roman emperor who died 18 centuries ago remained relevant to you as a commander in the United States Marine Corps in what way? Uh, it was good for me to be reminded that I faced nothing new under the sun. Uh, technology throws a few odd wrinkles in, but the bottom line is the fundamental uh, impulses, the fundamental challenges, and the solutions are pretty timeless in my line of work. Let me quote to you, this is an email I found that you, uh, on a military website from, that you wrote as you were preparing to deploy to Iraq back in the early 2000s, quote, for all the intellectuals running around today saying that the nature of war has fundamentally changed, I must respectfully say, not really. Alexander the Great would not be in the least perplexed by the enemy we face right now. What would Alexander the Great have seen in radical Islam that he would have recognized? When he was fighting in the same region uh, back uh, several thousand years ago, he confronted basically in what looked like an implacable foe, someone with a very different worldview. He was unconcerned in some ways about his own tactics. He had confidence that he knew how his forces could act and uh, their behavior on the battlefield. What he was concerned with was how to understand this enemy. And he would have found an enemy that even though it was not Islam, uh, you know, oriented in any way, mm -hmm. it was still a culture that look at the world differently than his. So he sought to understand it, and as he understood it, he understood how he would go after it. So, before committing to combat, understand the enemy. Absolutely. General, you, Jim, you testified, we're taping this at the tail end of January, earlier this very week, you testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee under the new chairman, fellow military man, John McCain, and instead of sitting there and telling the senators what you thought they ought to do, you sat there and told them the questions that you thought they ought to ask. And I'd like to take a few of the questions you proposed to John McCain and his colleagues and ask them of Jim Mattis. Quote, here's the first. When the decision is made to employ our forces in combat, the committee should ask, are the political objectives clearly defined and achievable? Explain that. Since World War II, we've entered probably five major conflicts. Uh, four of those did not turn out well. We went into them enthusiastically into Korea, into Vietnam. Uh, Desert Storm is an outlier. And then we did Afghanistan and Iraq. Desert and Storm is the one that went well. You, you should, Desert uh, Storm went well because it had very clearly defined political end state. And if you look at the president emeritus of Dartmouth University, Jim Wright, he wrote an article 
in the Atlantic in July of 2013, and he said, what did we learn from the Korean War? And basically what I drew from that was if you have murky or changing political end states, then you don't know how to end that war. And if you don't know how to end the war, the war will go on and on, the enemy will mutate, and the American people will understandably lose under, uh, an appreciation for what it is they're fighting for because it's not well articulated. So if you don't get the political end state right up front, you're going to be engaged in a, in a war you don't know how to end in favorable terms. Jim, does that mean that President George H.W. Bush in the first uh, Gulf War was correct? He came in for criticism for years afterwards and to some extent even today for not continuing all the way to Baghdad and toppling Saddam Hussein. Was he correct to stop where he stopped? He had said that the aim of the, of the, the campaign was to drive Iraq out of Kuwait, and once he had done that, he stopped. Was that the right thing to do? Absolutely. It was. He clarified the political objective. He drew together a worldwide coalition to support it. We went in and we did it, and then he did not allow mission creep. He did not do what would have broken, actually, the political coalition, which the military was simply the most forward part of. So yes, he was absolutely on target, and that's why we were able to end that war in a very uh, few number of days at, once the fighting started. So second Iraq war, we invade in 2003, and for three weeks, everything goes beautifully. We advance north, opposition melting away, and at the end of three weeks, Saddam Hussein and his regime were gone. And then for roughly four years, until President George W. Bush, the younger President Bush, instituted the surge, we changed tactics, we added troops, but there's a period between those first four weeks and the surge of some four years mm -hmm. when things just go sideways. How does a military man understand, how do you think about what went wrong? Right. First, uh, the attack did go very well for the first three weeks in a conventional terms, although I assure you it wasn't that swimmingly smooth for the lads on the front lines. It's just sure, something right. to remember. Uh, but what happens at that point is it's revealed that we don't have a clearly stated political end state. And now we start wandering. We're, we're in search of a political end state. So strategies, which are where you connect those means to achieving the political end state, now have got to start accommodating uncertainty. Uncertainty is, is sufficient on a battlefield to cause any strategy headaches. But it's absolutely impossible if you haven't figured out on your own part what you, want to intend, what you intend to do. So if you haven't got that part figured out, you have no constant objective that you're aiming towards. And now you start wandering on the battlefield, you start wandering intellectually. And what is, what is in the American system, good military men take it as a kind of sacred matter that they defer ultimately to the civilian authority. But you've just said in four engagements out of five major engagements since the Second World War, I think one of the, these are my words, you would never put it this way, but one of the things you're saying is the civilians screwed up. They did not give the professionals clearly defined objectives. When the professionals find the civilians failing to provide clear objectives, what is the professional's duty? Well, the duty uh, for generals, for admirals, is to press to try and get clearly stated political objectives. Uh, in our in our form of government, the military is subordinate to the civilian uh, leadership. The commander-in-chief is elected by the American people. I was never elected by the American people. I was promoted with the consent of the U.S. Senate. That's not the same as being elected. So I believe the role for the senior military officers is to be heard. They should insist on being heard. Mm. They must never insist on being obeyed in our form of government. But as they insist on being heard, they have to try to do this, carry out this national dialogue uh, without creating adversarial relationships with the political uh, leadership. Try to avoid that. Uh, and what you want to do that is, is hard. Well, it is hard. But what I learned over many years is something that 
Secretary Bob Gates uh, made very clear in some of his writing, and that is at the highest levels, it all depends on personal relationships. And so you've got to try to maintain uh, your best military advice without, uh, without creating any kind of animosity at that level. It is hard. You just have to keep working at it and try to walk a mile in their shoes as you try to close the gap between the appreciation the military has for the situation and, the, and as it's seen by the political leadership. And this is, this is not unique to our times today. We had the same challenges between FDR and, his, and General Marshall uh, in World War II, and certainly Abe Lincoln had challenges with his generals. So this is just part of uh, maintaining a, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people that needs military defenders, but at the same time, it does not exist for a military purpose. Afghanistan, two quotations on Afghanistan. Here's one, President Barack Obama on December 28th of last year, for more than 13 years, our nation has been at war in Afghanistan. Now our combat mission is ending and the longest war in American history is coming to a responsible conclusion. Close quote. Quotation two. This is Jim Mattis testifying to the Senate Armed Services Committee a few days ago. Gains achieved at great cost against our enemy in Afghanistan are reversible. We may not want this fight, but the barbarity of an enemy that kills women and children and has refused to break with Al-Qaeda, needs to be fought." Close quote. In your view, we're not done in Afghanistan. Is that right? Peter, in, in my line of work, the enemy gets a vote is the way we put it. You may want a war over, you may declare it over. The enemy may not agree, and you have to deal with that, that reality. We have irreconcilable differences with the Taliban. Secretary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, gave three conditions for the Taliban to be brought back inside the body politic of Afghanistan. One, break with Al-Qaeda. Two, quit killing people, stop using violence. And three, obey the Afghan constitution. They have refused that very low bar that would have allowed them to step over and come over to bringing their political ideas forward to see if the Afghan people would buy into them. The reason they don't do it, the reason they use bombs instead of going to the ballot box, is they know the Afghan people will not buy into it. So they will continue to support al-Qaeda. They will continue to do this kind of uh, terrorism that they conduct over there every day. And as they do that, for us to declare arbitrarily that the war is over uh, may not match the reality on the ground. All right, you've raised, in a, uh, in a kind of oblique way, but you've raised a point when you're in uniform, you insist on being heard, not you personally, but a leader of military professionals insist on being heard, but never insist on being obeyed. Mm -hmm. Now that you're out of uniform, you're, you, you spoke very eloquently and very carefully, but you didn't say a word against President Obama, even though I gave you a big fat opportunity to do so by quoting him. Mm -hmm. uh, you testified to the Senate Armed Services Committee, and again, you were very careful not to attack the president directly. You view your duty right now as describing this, what do you, how do you see your duty? You know a lot, you love your country, you understand the military, and you draw different conclusions from the administration. But you're, but you're being careful about what you say. Well, I'm not too careful. I've gotten in some trouble over the years. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not too careful about it. But I, I'm basically saying the same thing that I said in, in private meetings and even in public meetings uh, back when I was on active duty. Uh, the bottom line, I, I think, here is that I owe my best military advice, and at times that's uncomfortable. For a democracy that believes in, in freedom and it believes in peace and prosperity, uh, the idea that this level of evil can exist uh, is incompatible with our with our view of what we would like to see as we turn over this world to our children. But I'm also convinced, having dealt with this enemy since 1979, which was the first time I sailed into those waters on U.S. Navy ships, uh, that we're up against an enemy that means what they say and we should not patronize them. When they say girls don't go to school, you're not going to talk them out of it by simply having a, a picnic in the backyard and resolving your differences. Their views of the role of women their views of modernity, their views of tolerance,
for people who think differently are fundamentally different than ours. And Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. made very clear that between two irreconcilable worldviews, it's probably going to turn to a fight. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're in right now, whether we want it to be over or not. And in regards to the president, uh, loyalty, I was 40 odd years a naval officer. And loyalty, I learned, only counts when there's a hundred reasons not to be. And I would just tell you that the president's had a tough enough year and he doesn't need generals coming out now and characterizing him in negative terms. We, we owe the country, we owe the president our best advice. But I, I don't choose to take part in, uh, in going beyond that and characterizing people's motives or, or their performance as unsatisfactory. We're all trying to make sense of this world. Got it. Another of your questions to the Senate, which I'm now going to put to you, quote, I'm quoting you, Jim. As President Eisenhower noted, the foundation of our military strength is economic strength. No nation in history has maintained its military power if it failed to keep its fiscal house in order. How do you, this is you talking to the senators, how do you halt the damage caused by sequestration? Close quote. Sequestration, this is the budget sequester 2013 when Republicans and Democrats in Congress could not agree on what needed to be cut. So they set up a few uh, mm -hmm. automatic cuts. Mm -hmm. The idea was that the automatic cuts were so draconian they would force them to get together. They never did get together. And the sequest sequestration has taken place, cut the defense budget by about 6% in 2013, cut it again last year. And President Obama is now projected that he's going to propose spending on the Defense Department, something like 6% over sequester. Okay, so we end up with the Pentagon budget. We'll know, who knows where it's yeah. going to come out, but it's going to be about $500 billion to 530 if, you, if the president gets exactly what he seems to pro be proposing. Is that enough? Well, I don't know if it's enough, but I know one thing for certain. If you want to cut the defense budget, you should do it wisely and reducing your strategic ends, your political aims, make certain that you don't have a policy that requires a military that's larger than what you're willing to fund. The way we're doing it right now is we're doing it with arithmetic. Now let's put it in terms of a family budget. Mm -hmm. if, if, a, if a cut comes to your income and you say you have to take a 10% cut uh, in, in, your, in your family's budget, you don't cut vacations 10%, food 10%, life insurance 10%, rent 10%. You may cut out all your vacations or your restaurant meals and you wisely take that into account. What we're doing right now is we're doing these salami cuts of everything and the result is you have a mindless uh, application of our money in many cases going to priorities that no one agrees should be funded. So this is just silly. The engine for our national security has always been our economy. And whether you look back at the Roman Empire or you look at the Spanish Empire or the British Empire, no country, the Soviet Union, no country has maintained its military strength if it did not maintain its fiscal house in good order. And right now, we are spending so irresponsibly, we're going to turn over to the younger generation an injurious taxation and most of the money that we will be spending, which is, by the way, more within a couple of years servicing our debt. Right than we spend on the Department of Defense will be going to Riyadh, Moscow, Beijing, and Tokyo. Not all those countries are friends. And we are, put, we are spending words, we're our- borrowing, borrowing money from them and we're paying borrowing, they, they are holding our paper. Right. And we're going to be sending them money. And the young people who are growing up today, when you and I grew up, if we had a good idea, we could always find someone to fund us. And come in, we're, we're sitting here in Silicon Valley as we speak right now. In the future, that money may not be available because of the irresponsibility of the current uh, government, basically, and us. We, we've got to look at ourselves on this, that we're allowing this irresponsible spending that's going to burden the younger generation. Jim, one more question on spending. I fumbled away with $500 billion or $534 billion, 6%. The numbers are mind-boggling. Yeah. How do you, as a professional, say to an, a layman, an ordinary mayor, the, mm -hmm. this, the notion would be those numbers are so huge, it's hard to understand what they mean. And anybody who reads a memoir or two about the Pentagon understands that 
It's a gigantic operation. In many ways, it's bureaucratic. There are all kinds of rivalries, inter-service rivalries, intra-service rivalries taking place. Yeah. How can an American, an ordinary American who can't begin to go through all the detail, how can you have any confidence that the Pentagon budget, how do you know the Pentagon budget is right? Dwight Eisenhower said our military strength rests on our economic strength, but in his farewell address, he also warned about the military industrial complex, those contractors yeah. who are gonna lobby congressmen for contract. How, how do you know that it's being done right? Well, it's hard. Uh, it's hard and we can always find in a budget this large, we can find things that are waste or we can find things that in all likelihood we don't need in a military budget. The challenge is how do you set up the processes to audit it, to govern it, to allocate those, those resources in a responsible manner. And what I've found over many years in many different organizations, if you take good people and good ideas and you match them with bad processes, the bad processes will win nine out of 10 times. Right now, the processes have become so convoluted, the laws are so complex, governing acquisition, the budgets themselves are so uh, detailed in some areas, uh, directing things that even the military, we don't ask for, frankly, right, right. that you can't really get the good ideas forward and have them governing all aspects of the budget. Now this is normal, this is not something where all of a sudden one day we're going to find the holy grail and say presto, we know how to, how to solve this. But we've got to work this in a manner that creates processes that return integrity, to the managerial integrity to the system. We know what to do with corruption. I mean, we put people in jail for that sort of thing. Right. This is not about corruption. This is about uh, using the resources wisely the American people have given us. And it, it, you're right, it's become so big, it's hard really to, uh, to calculate that. Another of your questions for the Senate Armed Services Committee that I'm turning on you. Mm -hmm. Is the U.S. military being developed to fight across the full spectrum of combat? Our forces must be capable of missions from nuclear deterrence to counterinsurgency and everything in between, now including the pervasive cyber domain. Let me just take you around the world. Do you believe we now have the proper spectrum of forces in place to deal with a rising China? Well, in light of China's bullying in the South China Sea, I don't think we're building enough ships. I think we are going to be forced as we pull more of our forces home from overseas, uh, from the Cold War days, and that was appropriate, we bring them home. But we're going to be forced into a more naval strategy as far as the military strategy for America. As a result, we're gonna to have to look at what we're doing and we may have to give the Navy a bigger slice of the budget in order to carry out the kind of uh, operations that reassure our friends and temper our adversaries' de designs. I mean, it's all well and good we're trying to get along with China, and I, I completely endorse that. I don't think China sees any value to going to war with the United States. But at the same time, there are a lot of nations out in that region that would like to see more U.S. navies making port calls in their harbors, from Vietnam to the Philippines, from Malaysia to Taiwan and Japan. And if you don't have enough ships, then you're gonna have a hard time doing that. And sometimes in this world, the best ambassador you can have is a man of war. So we're going to have to look at this to make certain we're making a military fit for its time, is the bottom line. Iran. Ah, uh, yes. Do we have the spectrum in place to deal with Iran? Uh, yes. Uh, obviously, it would take more forces if we had to go with a military option for Iran, which the president has not taken off the table. Uh, but yes, we, we can handle Iran. You're, com you're comfortable with that one? I have no doubt. All right. You know, thank you, because I will sleep better tonight, at least with regard to Iran. Well, remember, war now, Peter, is fundamentally an unpredictable phenomenon. So I'm not saying that it would be carefree. Uh, I'm not saying we can be careless, and it would be bloody awful. It would be a catastrophe if we have to have another war in the Middle East like that. But could we handle it from a military point of view? Absolutely. ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. 2014, June 2014, ISIL declares itself a worldwide caliphate. It has attracted thousands of combatants from, the United, from Europe and from the United States. 
It now controls about half of Syria and about a third of Iraq. That may be a little less today because the Kurds announced that they were, they're moving in, but it, they've got a lot of territory and they're carrying out, you spoke earlier about the barbarity of the Taliban, the ISIL are carrying out, they've carried out thousands of executions of religious and political opponents, and these, are in, these include beheadings mm -hmm. and crucifixions. Do we have the proper spectrum of forces in place to deal with ISIL? Well, we have the forces uh, available, the military forces available. Uh, they're not in place, but that reflects the political decision. The question is, do we have the political will to deal with ISIL in an intelligent and effective manner? Uh, they, how to put this, they, they're an organization that are a little bit like Lebanese Hezbollah uh, in terms of trying to create social services. They're a lot like Al-Qaeda operationally but, or philosophically, but operationally, they're like Al-Qaeda on steroids. And when you put that together, they're, they're a uh, uniquely capable organization. Uh, but the fact is they couldn't last two minutes in a fight with, uh, with our troops. Mm. And so it's a, it comes down to having a good strategy. It comes down to a political situation in Baghdad that draws Sunnis and Kurds and Shia together. Uh, and I think that the new prime minister has, has done some things in the right direction on that. But it also comes down to making certain that we know what it is, not only what we fight for in this world, but what we will not tolerate. And the kind of assassinations, the mass killings, the, the mass rapes that are going on there, uh, this is a group that deserves no, no support from anyone. And we should try to shut down its recruiting, shut down its finances, and then work uh, to fight battles of annihilation, not attrition, but annihilation against them. So the first time they meet the forces that we put against them. There should be basically no survivors. Uh, they should learn that we can be uh, even tougher than them, uh, except for the ones who surrender. Obviously, we don't kill prisoners, but if they want to fight, uh, they should pay a heck of a price for what they've done to innocent people out there. Okay, Jim, now here's another. I'm going to put myself in your hands as a layman and just ask you to explain to me how to think of the kind of conflict you just described, and here's what, I'm, here's what I mean. This goes back to your first question, clear definition, objectives, end state. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned five engagements since the Second World War. Let me mention, well, so the Second World War, we knew whom we had to beat. Imperial Japan needed to surrender, and Nazi Germany needed to surrender, and Rundstedt signed a, dec a, a document of surrender and the Japanese sent representatives to the USS Missouri and they signed in front of MacArthur. It ended. We knew who they were, we knew where they were, and we knew how to take them on. Cold War, the Soviet Union on December 25th, 1991, ceases to exist. ISIL has territory. That's one, I could sort of, okay, that, to that extent, I understand we, they can't end up controlling that territory. But if you think in terms of the conflict with radical Islam, you've got ISIL, mm -hmm. the Taliban, Al-Qaeda seems to have franchise operations almost like McDonald's there in Yemen and elsewhere. We've got places I didn't even, I'd never heard of Boko Haram in Nigeria until a couple of months ago. Turns out they've been there for quite a while. Yesterday's newspaper, there was an, uh, an attack in the Sinai in which some 20 Egyptians were, so activity is taking place against mm -hmm. Gen, uh, President Sisi, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, right. in Egypt. And this is 13 years after 9-11. So yeah. Lehman Robinson says, this, 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 is like, this is metastasis, or uh, cancer is, let's not, let's not be melodramatic, just as a, it's like the, 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 the kid's toy, you push it down here and it pops up there. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how, do we, how do we fight a phenomenon, radical yeah. Islam, as opposed to a state? Well, the problem with Islam goes back to the days of the prophet and when he dies and it splits into two halves. And at that point, uh, they, they've got an internal war that's kept, uh, kept waxing and waning over the years. Between the Sunni and the Shia. Between the Sunni and the Shia. And then the first time that I think I could find 
jihad in our presidential papers is with Thomas Jefferson. And for the Marine Corps, we got to the shores of Tripoli in our song uh, from that campaign. So no, this is not this is not new, and it has gone on for a long time. Obviously, it's in a waxing phase. It's getting stronger. Uh, I think the first question you have to ask is, uh, as you try to make sense out of all this, is political Islam in our best interest? And let me define political Islam. From the Sunni side, it would be the Muslim brothers in Cairo for a year after the, uh, the Arab Spring put them in power. Or in Tehran with the Shia side, is, uh, is political Islam is practiced in Tehran uh, in our best interest? No. If, if neither, that is neither, the answer, neither one. I'll and answer I that. defer to the American people. If All that right. is what uh, you think, then what is our effort? How should our effort look to support the countervailing forces? You brought up General Al Sisi, now President Al Sisi. Yes. Uh, he went out to Al Azhar University, the oldest, most famous university in all of the Arab lands, on January 1st, I think it was, and he said that there has got to be a change in thinking, and the clerics need to lead that. That there's something wrong with Islam when the whole world is starting to see it as a murderous religion. He says, I'm not talking about changing the religion, I'm talking about changing the thinking. If you go to Muhammad bin Zayed, the crown prince in the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. he believes that you've got to have a modern state and that political Islam has no role in governance. Obviously, each person's morality and their, their relationship with their God guides them, but it's not the government. It doesn't guide the government. The government is guided by men. No theocracy, no Sharia exactly. law. You go to the king of Jordan who believes in moderate Islam. You go to any number of people out there who will fight alongside us. I've fought many times in the Middle East. I never fought in an all-American formation. I always had Arabs beside me, always had Muslims beside me. And I bring this up because when we ask those fundamental questions and we recognize the reality of today's challenges, it will lead us to certain behavior, like taking our own side in the fight and supporting the people I just mentioned, rather than confusing them. And so we're going to have to look at this because back in the 1980s, 1983, the Lebanese Hezbollah, the Iranian-inspired militias, declared war basically on the United States. They blew up our embassy in, in Beirut. They uh, attacked the French paratrooper barracks, attacked the U.S. Marine barracks, and they've killed Americans many times since. Uh, they tried to kill Ambassador Adel, the Saudi ambassador to Washington, D.C., two miles from the White House here two years ago. And that was the decision taken at the highest levels in Tehran, and we have done nothing about it. That side of the, the insurgency, the terrorism, the violent jihadist extremist terrorists has not been touched by the Americans. At the same time, Al-Qaeda declares war on us in the 1990s. They try to bring the trade towers down. They succeed the second time. They attack the USS Cole. They blow up two of our embassies in East Africa. And though that organization, we have shredded their senior leadership. But it, you're right, it is franchised. It's Al-Shabaab in Somalia, it's AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in, in Yemen. Uh, of course, we've got ISIS, there's Boko Haram, and I can go on. Uh, and so, bottom line is you have to recognize the historic roots and you've got to go after it by supporting the countervailing forces and creating the worldwide alliance like we did in World War II based on the clarity of defining the problem. Remember Einstein said, if given one hour to save the world, I'd spend 55 minutes composing my thoughts on what the problem is, and I'd save the world in five minutes. We're gonna to have to put in the intellectual thinking to figure out what it is that we defend, and more importantly, what we will not tolerate in the world. Jim, that amounts to a call for new seriousness on the part of the civilian leaders. Is that not correct? Uh, and military. Uh, guided by our intelligence services that uh, actually have done a very good job outlining what this enemy looks like. All right, a couple of final questions. The movie American Sniper has reopened a debate about the cost of war, especially of course on, the, on those who volunteer for the forces and do the actual fighting. Here's a recent quotation from you. You spoke at a veterans group not too long ago. Quote, although I, this is before the movie opened, still you're addressing the issues that the movie has raised. Quote, I would just say there is one misperception of our veterans 
and that is they are somehow damaged goods. I don't buy it. There is also something called post-traumatic growth. Explain what you mean. Anyone who goes to war, uh, well, let me, let me change that. Going to war is one thing. You can deploy to a dangerous wartime situation uh, without being in combat. An awful lot of people are in support jobs. But for those who close in on the enemy, who seek out, close with, to kill the enemy, uh, it is a very atavistic, primitive environment, and there is post-traumatic stress for anyone who's been through it. There is stress, no doubt about it. You grant that? Absolutely. In it, fact, it, you insist on it. it well, happens. it's not an insignificant moment, Peter, the first time you draw down and you shoot your fellow man. That's all there is to it, or you see your buddy hit next to you. So the bottom line, there's going to be stress, but it does not have to be post-traumatic disorder or, or, or syndrome, or you don't have to come at it from a position of illness. You can come at it from a position of wellness, from a position of growth as a human being. I've seen people come out of this sort of thing uh, better, better men, better husbands, better fathers, more in touch with their God or whatever their source of spiritual strength is, uh, kinder, uh, more compassionate. Now, uh, uh, there was a Civil War general uh, named Chamberlain who rose to be the president of Bowden College in Maine, and he said, combat makes good men better and bad men worse. Mm -hmm. So there is the reality that not, uh, not everyone reacts the same way. But I don't buy that somehow uh, if you came home from Iwo Jima or Gettysburg or Iraq or Afghanistan that somehow you're you're limited in what you can do. The greatest generation came home from World War II, the worst war in world history, and they created uh, good communities. They rose to be college presidents, start industries that created wealth for the, for the working man. Uh, I, I just don't buy that somehow that we're uh, handicapped because we've been in those circumstances. I recognize the grim realities. I don't recognize the limited potential of the human being when they come out of that. Jim, last question. Mm -hmm. Although you retired with four stars, mm -hmm. you joined the Marine Corps as a kid. You were 19 years old. 18, actually. 18, sorry, all right. And uh, so here's the question. What would you say to an 18-year-old today? When you joined up, the United States was self-confident enough to be engaged in and ultimately to win a 45-year-old, 45-year conflict, the Cold War. There are questions about how self-confident the country is today. We face this complicated new enemy, this new set of circumstances and conditions. And at the same time, the private economy has produced opportunities for 18 and 19-year-old kids that they didn't face when you were a kid up in Washington, in the farm country up in Washington State. What would you say, what would you say to a kid in your circumstances up in Washington State, or maybe somebody here at Stanford University who's considering the ROTC program, about why a career in the armed forces of the United States would still be a worthwhile to spend 20 or more years of your life? Well, I, I think what you want want to do is explain that there comes a point in your life when you want to know that you serve for a purpose in this world. And there's a gravestone up in Cypress Hill Cemetery in New York with a guy that we all loved when we were kids growing up. He was a sparkling baseball player. We all wanted to be Jackie Robinson. Sure. And if you go to that grave today, it says a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. That was, and he wrote his own epitaph, by the way. I think that when you look at this experiment we call America, we should not look at the people who founded it as if they had an easy time of it and they are now just faces on dollar bills. Uh, we should not look at this as something that is just automatically our inheritance. We're going to have to work for it and at times we're going to have to fight for it because we might have been born here, most of us, uh, by complete accident, good fortune. Uh, we lived here by choice but we have an obligation to turn this free country over to young men and women with the same freedoms that we got when we grew up in it. 
And if you want to be part of something that keeps you from sitting in a psychiatrist chair when you're 45, wondering what you do with your life, you can't go wrong than going up, than joining up the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, and spending four years. And if you like it, you stick around for longer. Uh, frankly, I disliked many of the jobs I had as a Marine. Uh, I grew to hate minefields when I was a 21-year-old infantry lieutenant, uh, but I also grew to love being around guys who'd crawl willingly into minefields alongside you. And so I, I, uh, I just recommend it if you want to get far from the well-lit avenues of life and go test yourself in the toughest circumstance alongside the best people in the world, you'll never regret serving in the U.S. military. General James Mattis, United States Marine Corps, thank you. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.